الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله صلى الله وسلم على رسول الله وعلى اله واصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه الى يوم الدين اما بعد Firstly, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his mercy on those who were killed for saying La ilaha illallah in New Zealand and that was their, that was their only crime. And nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the believers, it says, وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ It's a duty upon us. Allah has made it an obligation upon Himself to give victory to the believers. And may Allah Ta'ala ease the suffering of all the Muslims around the world. Because it's not new. It's not something that's new, or nor should it be surprising. Maybe it shook people more than more than it normally would because things were very graphic and people were able to view uh, what happened. Otherwise, killing that's happening elsewhere is, is no less vile than, than what we saw today. Um, moving on to our topic, We've spoken about, so far, we've spoken about the development of fiqh in the time of the companions and how it was transmitted to the time of the tabi'een and those who came after them. And we looked at the fiqh of the former dhahib also, how they developed. And we said that the former dhahib are a continuation of previous schools. And really, when it comes to the former Dahib, although it was a phase in the history of Islam, in reality the concept of Madahib has always existed. And we quoted Ali ibn Madini, rahimahullah, the Shaykh of al-Bukhari, uh, saying that some of the companions had Madahib and students who would take with the Madhab of their teachers. And he uses the word Madhab. And that's, that's obvious because any person who has a teacher is likely going to be influenced by that teacher, if, especially if it's a knowledgeable teacher. So if you imagine that somebody's teacher is Zayd ibn Thabit and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Abdullah ibn Abbas, of course we expect that their students are going to be impacted by them very much and so they're going to carry on their, their knowledge and their legacy. Similarly, there were certain scholars throughout the history of Islam who had students who were greatly impacted by their teachers um, and they continued, they continued uh, what their teachers had begun. Now, another madhab that is still alive today, although not as widespread or well known as the former madhab, is the madhab of Dawood. Madhab Dawood ibn Ali al Zahiri al Asfahani. This madhab almost died out. The Zahiri madhab. Zahir means what? Zahir means apparent. So the Zahiri madhab is known for its very apparent approach and literal approach to dealing with the text of the Quran and Hadith. Dawood ibn Ali was initially a Shafi'i. He followed the Shafi'i Madhab. He was a student of the student of a Shafi'i, so he didn't meet a Shafi'i directly, but he was a student of his students. Abu Thawr, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, is one of the students of a Shafi'i, and Ishaq ibn Rahawiyah, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, also one of the students of a Shafi'i. These two were teachers of Dawood ibn Ali. Dawood ibn Ali. As Imam al-Bayhaqi rahimahullah says, he says initially he was a strong defendant, defender of the Shafi'i school. But then later on he took the, he took the Zahiri approach. Later on he took a Zahiri approach towards dealing with fiqh. And uh, throughout history some people have been impacted by this approach. It's a very easy approach, uh, which is what you know, 
makes some people just want to follow it. It's just any Quran, authentic hadith, and we take it as they are. Don't go too much beyond it. Whereas when it comes to the fuqaha, especially the fuqaha of Kufa, they didn't find that sufficient. So the Quran has eternal meanings, the Sunnah of the Prophet has meanings, and it's not just about understanding the words of the verses in ahadith, it's about understanding the meanings also that come with it. Because the Sharia is an eternal Sharia that remains until the Day of Judgment. And if we are just looking at, at the apparent words and not going extending ourselves beyond that, then that will only take us so far. That doesn't mean that taking with the apparent words of the Qur'an and Sunnah is wrong. Not at all. In fact, taking with the apparent words of the Qur'an and Sunnah is the, is the rule, is the general rule. Because the Qur'an is a clear Arabic tongue. بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍ مُبِينٍ With a clear Arabic tongue. So that means that the words of the Qur'an and the words of the Sunnah of the Prophet are to be understood as they come, as they are. Unless we have a reason to go against the Zahir and we make Ta'wil or Tafsir and we go with the metaphorical meaning or the non-apparent meaning. So this is not necessarily an incorrect method. And all scholars take with this Zahiri approach. Every scholar takes with a Zahiri approach. But just at different levels. Uh, this madhab would almost have died out if it wasn't for one man who gave life to this madhab and allowed it to continue till today. Although today it's, it's almost a historical madhab because not many people take it as an official school of thought but many people are influenced by it. Who's the name of, what's the name of this person who, gave, who brought back to life the Zahiri madhab? Ibn Hazm, Abu Muhammad, Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi. Uh, this man passed away 456 years after the Hijrah, if I'm not mistaken, 456, yeah. And he was from Andalus, you know, Spain, modern day Spain. <coughs> and he was impacted by the approach of Dawood al Zahiri. He wrote two very important books. One of it was one of it is a muhalla, a book which is filled with ahadith and verses, filled with reports from the Sahaba and Tabi'een. He often quotes the opinions of Dawood ibn Ali of Zahiri, and it's a very important book in Islam. The famous Shafi'i scholar who was an Ezid Abd Salam says, "I was not comfortable until I." got a copy of two books Al-Muhalla by Ibn Hazm and Al-Mughni by Ibn Qudam He said when I got a copy of these two books I was comfortable giving fatwa and speaking about knowledge because these two are encyclopedias these two books are encyclopedias one is Al-Muhalla by Ibn Hazm and the other is Al-Mughni by Ibn Qudam Al-Hanbali The second book is Al-Ihkam fi Usul Al-Ahkam Al-Ihkam fi Usul Al-Ihkam This book is in Usul Al-Fiqh So Ibn Hazm has written in Fiqh And he's written in Usul Al-Fiqh which, which, And these two are necessary components for any madhab And this is why um, You don't find today The madhab of the Sahaba No one today says I follow the madhab of Zayd ibn Thabit We wish We wish we could but we, nobody has put the effort into compiling the fiqh of Zayd ibn Thabit and the fiqh of uh, and his usul and so on so that this school can, can develop and grow. It has happened through the school of Malik but it's attributed to Malik because Malik is the one who Allah willed for him his opinion to be, to, to be spread and his influence to spread. It doesn't mean that today we don't have the knowledge of the companions. The knowledge of the companions is with us today. The fiqh of the companions is with us today. Because as we said, knowledge is transmission. Abu Hanifa and Malik and Ahmed and Shafi would have been nothing if it wasn't for the fiqh of the Sahaba that came to them. Knowledge is what they, they took from them. So that's the madhab of Dawood ibn Ali al-Zahiri. So we've spoken about the, the former madhab and this fifth kind of madhab. Of course, some scholars consider the Zahiri madhab to be nothing. So if Ibn Hazm or Dawood ibn Ali hold an opinion, they say this opinion is like non-existent. 
because they consider it to be an opinion that's not not valid, not uh, not part of the mainstream opinions, which is questionable. Questionable. Why is it questionable? Because Dawid ibn Ali was a scholar. So if he's a scholar, then why should we rule him out and his opinions out? Is it because he has some views that are problematic? Yes, he does have some views that are problematic. But so do some other scholars. That's something that exists everywhere. So that's not, some, that's not a reason to rule out a scholar as a whole and say his opinions don't count. His opinions don't count unless he agrees with it. That, that means his opinions don't count at all. If you say his opinions don't count unless he agrees with the mainstream positions, then that means his opinion doesn't count at all. Uh, so no, his opinions are scholarly opinions. So are the opinions of Thaw, Abu Thaw. So are the opinions of the Muhaddithin, Al-Bukhari and Ishaq ibn Rahawi and Al-Humaydi and Ibn Khuzayma. They're scholars and they're scholars of Ijtihad and their opinions are opinions of scholars, interpretations of the Sharia. Why do they have to be considered outside of, of valid scholarly opinions? Of course, why did some scholars kick these views out? Because there became a strong emphasis on the former dahib. There was such a strong focus on the former dahib that some scholars considered anything outside of the former dahib to be deviance, deviation. Uh, which has its problems, of course. Because you're restricting knowledge like that. You're restricting knowledge. Some scholars were like this. Some scholars restricted and said any opinion outside the former dahib is, is wrong. And other scholars said, generally speaking, the truth is not found outside the former dahib. Like Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says, you will not find the truth outside of the former dahib sharia in the sharia generally speaking. So there might be a few exceptions, but generally, as a general rule, the truth won't be found outside these former dahib. Especially if we widen the circle of the former dahib. What does that mean? That means there's a lot of difference within the former dahib itself. So within one madhab, you will find so many different views and so many different opinions. So if we're including all of that, then fine. So how about those who um, say they don't follow any but well, that they, they, just, they just take from the original sources? No one takes from the original sources because no one is... Uh, uh, you know, no one can not depend on, on the scholars who came before. So, for someone today to say, I, I just take from original sources, that's me, that means nothing. So, is uh, they actually do follow what they want. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Yeah. Every human being follows a madhab or a scholar. A scholar is a madhab. There's no, there's, no, there's no difference. It's just the difference is one person chooses to follow one madhab and another person doesn't really bother with which madhab. But he asks the scholars he trusts. So either way, both people are, are following people of knowledge. This person chooses to follow one school, and the other person, he's not too interested in following one specific school, but he follows different, different scholars. And these people are different levels as well. Some of them are pure, and muqallid. He's a lay person, he doesn't have uh, much of a strong background in Sharia. He has some basic knowledge of Islam, but not capable of looking at the scholars' opinions and their differences and their views and their arguments and, and weighing up. The, 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 such a person just makes taqlid just makes taqlid of a scholar whoever he trusts could be one of the former dahib or it could be a local scholar he trusts something like that there's no issue because Allah commands us in the Quran to follow the people of dhikr the people of knowledge dhikr means the Quran فَسَلُوهَ لَذِّكْرِ إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرِ وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ لِتُبَيَّنَ النَّاسِ so the word dhikr refers to the Quran so the people of knowledge are the people of the Qur'an. People who have knowledge of the Qur'an and what comes with the Qur'an, which is the tafsir of the Qur'an in the sunnah. So Allah has only commanded us to ask scholars. He hasn't commanded us to ask any specific person or any specific individual. And so therefore there's no harm, as we'll come to see. We'll, come, we'll look at the position of it being obligatory to follow one of the former dahi. Because that's an opinion which has been held historically and is still held today. It's wajib to follow one of the former dahi and to stick to it. We'll look at that position and see, uh, see who argued for that and why they did so. Um, when it comes to, so we've looked at the madhahib, when it comes to attributing ourselves to a madhahib, attributing 
uh, or before that, before that, attributing opinions to a madhab. Not attributing ourselves, attributing an opinion. This is an important thing because sometimes people mistakenly attribute things to, to an imam. Why does that happen? That happens for a number of reasons. Firstly, taking knowledge from the wrong books. Taking knowledge from the wrong books. So you're taking the opinions of the Shafi'i scholars from Hanafi books. That's wrong. Hanafi books are not authorities in the Shafi'i fiqh. Hanafi scholar, maybe he's an expert in Hanafi fiqh, it doesn't make him an expert in Shafi'i fiqh. Maybe he, he makes an error when it comes to attributing an opinion to the Shafi'i school. And that happens a lot, by the way. Happens a lot. So that's the first thing. Secondly, a person might take an opinion that's in one of the four madhahib and attribute it to the madhahib. So he takes the opinion of one of the Hanbali scholars and says the Hanbalis say this. That's wrong. That's incorrect. You can't attribute that to the whole school if it's the position of one, one scholar. Because there are methods of making tasheeh, correcting opinions, and or make considering opinions reliable or unreliable in any madhahib. That's a very important thing. Some people have attributed to the Hanafi opin- madhab opinions which are not the Hanafi madhab. They're held by some people. Maybe some st- st- scholars historically have held that view. Like some people are critical of the Hanafi school and they say the Hanafis allow for the Quran to be written in urine and for the Quran to be written in blood. And that it's unfair to attribute that to the, Han- to the Hanafi school because the Hanafi scholars themselves have have criticized this. It does exist. It's an opinion that exists. Why do they say you're allowed to do that? They say for, as a type of ruqya. As a type of ruqya, you, you do this type of thing. Which is not an acceptable opinion. It's not an acceptable opinion. Just because it exists in Islamic history doesn't make it correct. It doesn't make it acceptable. But it's, it's unfair to, to attribute that to the Hanafi school. As some people do that. Um, also, uh, problems occur when there's a lack of expertise in a madhab. So you will take the statement of one of the scholars of the madhab, but apply it in the wrong place. You'll apply it in the wrong place. For example, according to Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, is it permissible to greet a non-Muslim for his festivals and celebrations and things like that? According to Imam Ahmad, there are two opinions. One opinion says that you can greet them for worldly matters. Marriage, a new child, okay, graduation, a new job. You can congratulate a non-Muslim for that, for these types of celebrations or festivals. The second opinion says you can't even do that. You can't even do that. And that's the famous opinion of Ahmad. Some people took that opinion and said in one of the opinions of Imam Ahmad you're allowed to congratulate non-Muslims for their religious festivals. So they've used his opinion on worldly festivals and applied it to religious festivals. So they said, based on one of the opinions of Imam Ahmad it's permissible to congratulate non-Muslims for Christmas or uh, Easter or various other celebrations that they have, which is not the opinion of Ahmad. And it's not an opinion... from Imam Ahmad either. So there's a misattribution here. Why is there a misattribution? Because lack of expertise in the, in the fiqh of Ahmad. Because most people don't read the fiqh of the Hanbalis at length. They just read bits and bobs every time they hear of something. They, they, they read a bit from here, a bit from there, a bit from there. Only the person who is a student of knowledge or a scholar in Hanbali fiqh will spend time to read volumes and volumes and volumes. So he will know what's going on. He'll know what's going on. So when someone comes along and, and takes something out of context, or um, misattributes, then that's a problem. That's a problem. And this happens, and there are many, many examples of that. There are many examples of that. Okay. So attributing positions to a madhab is important to go to the right people, to know whether we can say this is the madhab of so-and-so, this is the madhab of so-and-so. Now attributing yourself to a madhab, to say, I am so-and-so the Hanbali, Abdullah ibn Abdullah al-Maliki, Abdullah ibn Abdullah al-Hanafi, 
so and so a Shafi'i. Yeah? Attributing yourself to one of the four uh, For over a thousand years now, the scholars have been doing that. For over a thousand years, the scholars have attributed themselves to one of the former that. And that's why you will rarely find a scholar who lived after the former Dahib, except that he has, he's attributing himself to one of the Madahib. And you can start of as early as uh, Qadi Abu Yusuf in the second century, and Muhammad ibn Hassan in the second century, and uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Qasim in the second century, down to al tahawi down to uh, Abu Hassan Karhi, Al Jassas, Al Bayhaqi, Ibn Abdul Bar, Al Quduri, Ibn Qudama, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Rajab, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Al Qayyim. All of them uh, attribute themselves to a method. And there's no issue there whatsoever because a person is not saying, I'm part of a, a new religion. But it's simply, it's like saying, I was brought up following this method. I was brought up studying this madhab. When I studied fiqh, I studied this madhab. So I call myself Hanbali. Like a Nadwi. A lot of people uh, refer to it as a Nadwi. Something a Nadwi. Sheikh Abul Hassan, a Nadwi. Okay, Rahimahullah. And a number of a Nadwi. And here in the UK, in Cambridge, Sheikh Akram Nadwi. What does that mean? It's an attribution to a school. That's it. Studied in Nadwa al Ulama. That's all it means. Studied in a school. So and so al Azhari. So and so the Azhari. What it means what? Attribution to a school. Studied in Azhar. Similarly, if a person attributes themselves to a madhab, it simply means they yani, have studied this madhab, their teachers are from this madhab, and so on. So there's no issue. There's no issue. So long as it doesn't become a reason for aggression or disunity or dispute, there's no harm in that type of attribution. Uh, one thing that we should remember and keep in mind is that every madhab is a vast school of law. We've touched upon this already. We should not think that a madhab is one opinion. A madhab is one opinion. That's incorrect. A madhab is not one opinion. A madhab is a galaxy of scholars with different approaches, different understandings, and different opinions. This needs to be understood. And some people today expect every single Hanafi to follow one Hanafi view. Why? Every single person under the sun must follow this Hanafi view, the Muftabihi. Okay, the Muftabihi in, in the Madhab. Hanafi scholars are many. Hanafi scholars might disagree. Hanafi, one Hanafi scholar says this is the Madhab, another Hanafi scholar that's, says that's the Madhab. But you find some people insisting on on only one view being allowed to follow. If you gave your previous Hanafi scholars the right to go against the madhab, then current Hanafi scholars also have the right to go against their madhab. And there's no issue there whatsoever. So that's something to, to keep in mind. These madhab are very, very vast. Especially in the Hanbali school. The opinions in the Hanbali school vary a lot. And they can be taken and acted upon. Some people are critical of, for example, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. And they say his opinions, they don't count because they're outside the former dahib and so on. Like his opinion that three divorces count as one divorce. Or his opinion that if someone divorces his wife when she's on her menstrual cycle, the divorce doesn't occur. Uh, or various other opinions that he has. Some scholars... Uh, Critical of, of his views because, because they say he's gone against the former Dahab. How can Ibn Taymiyyah go? Ibn Taymiyyah is one of the Imams of the Hanbali school. His opinions are considered strong opinions in the Hanbali school. He's a Hanbali. He's from the Imams of the Hanbalis. And some people think he, he's outside of the full schools. That's because they don't know him, Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. They don't know him. And they don't know the respect that later Hanbali scholars have for him. The relied upon Han Hanbali books, the relied upon Hanbali books, are the books of Ibn Muflih, the books of Ala Adin Mardawi, the books of Ibn Al Najjar Al Futuhi, the Sheikh Musa Al Hajjawi, and the Sheikh Mansur Ibn Yunus Al Buhuti. These are five scholars who are considered authoritative in the Hanbali school. If these five agree on something, 
That's the Hanbali Madhab without hesitation. If these five scholars agree on something, that's the end of the matter. No more discussions after that. All five of them quote Ibn Taymiyyah from beginning till end, constantly. Constantly quote him. Whether Ibn Najjar, whether Ibn Buhuti, whether Ibn Futuhi, whether Ibn Muflih. Ibn Muflih is of course Ibn Taymiyyah's teacher, a uh, student. Ibn Muflih is his student. So he quotes his teacher of course a lot. And it used to be that the Hanbalis, when they used the word Ash-Shaykh, they are referring to who? They're referring to Ibn Qudama. When they use the word Ash-Shaykh, the Shaykh, they're referring to Ibn Qudama. After Ibn Muflih, whenever you find the word Ash-Shaykh in the books of the Hanbalis, it refers to who? Ibn Taymiyyah. The word Ash-Shaykh, the Shaykh. And that's a great, uh, that shows that the Hanbalis hold Ibn Taymiyyah in great, great regard. Another Hanbali scholar who is very authoritative in the madhab is the Sheikh Mar'i al-Karmi. Sheikh Mar'i al-Karmi. He is someone who passed away uh, in the year 1033 after Hijrah. And he wrote a very important book in the Hanbali madhab called Ghayat al-Muntaha. Fi al-Jam'i bayna al-Iqna'i wa al-Muntaha. He says, Rahimahullah, about the opinions of Ibn Taymiyyah. The opinions of Ibn Taymiyyah, such as his opinions on talaq, are opinions that are within the madhab and are opinions that a mufti can rely upon. A mufti can rely upon. So uh, that means that the one who tries to restrict schools, the Hanbali madhab has to be just one view. The Hanafi madhab has to be just one view. The Maliki madhab has to be just be one view. Why? Two students of Abu Hanifa disagree on things. Both students of Abu Hanifa. Many students in the Hanafi school disagree on opinions. Hanafi scholars hold opinions which go against all form of dahib. Some Maliki scholars hold opinions that go against all form of dahib. Some Shafi'i scholars hold opinions that go against all form of dahib. And some Hanbali scholars hold opinions that go against all form of dahib. When I say go against the form of dahib, we shouldn't think they're going against hundreds and thousands of scholars. No, I mean the, the one relied upon opinion in the madhab. That's what I mean. So this is something that's acceptable. Uh, it's not something that is going against the deen or going against the sharia. Because ultimately, these are people of, people of knowledge who have reliable, reliable views. So the madhahib, you should know that a madhahib is not necessarily one thing. The madhahib have, have scope. That doesn't mean that there are no guidelines in the madhahib. There are guidelines. And there are some opinions that are accepted and some opinions that are rejected. Some opinions are strong, some opinions are weak. That does exist. And a lot of effort has gone into that. So we can't neglect that or think that you can follow anything that anyone said in any madhab. No. But we should also not be too restrictive. And we should realize that actually a lot of the time there is scope within, within the same madhab. Within the same madhab. Yeah, do, do some of the opinions of contemporary scholars of any madhab abrogate the previous uh, opinions of, of that madhab? Yes, they can. And that's happened throughout history. In fact, sometimes Abu Hanifa rahimahullah holds an opinion and the later students of the Hanafi school go against that opinion. And they say, we're going against this opinion. Why? Because change of circumstances. Change of circumstances makes us go against the position of Abu Hanif. And similarly today we have a change of circumstances. We're not living in the time of Al-Quduri who lived a thousand years ago. Not living in the time of Sahib Al-Hidayah 900 years ago. Not living in the time of Qadi Khan and Al-Kasani etc. Over a thousand years or 900 years changes occurred in life. Changes occurred. And so contemporary scholars have also looked at things and they consider that today the, the, the fatwa of the madhab on this issue is not what we're going to go with. We're going to go with a different position. And so there's no harm in that. Because, because what's the benefit of knowing a madhab? The mufta bihi, as they say. The opinion which you give fatwa according to. sahih fil madhab, the correct opinion. What's the benefit of it? The benefit is to know what to act upon. And if you're a mufti, the benefit is to know what to give fatwa according to. So if the fatwa today is according to this view and no longer according to the past view, then I should 
That's the view that's rely relied upon, no longer that previous view. Um, linked to this topic is the issue of taqlid, question of taqlid. Uh, taqlid simply means to follow another person. Taqlid is to follow. Okay, so if you're making taqlid of a scholar, you're following his opinion, you're following his view. Taqlid is one of those issues that uh, need clarification. It doesn't just mean one thing, taqlid. And therefore, if someone says taqlid is haram, for example, that means they haven't understood what taqlid is. Taqlid is more than that. Taqlid has a number of issues come, in, come into play. There's no such thing as taqlid is haram because every person has an element of taqlid and an element of ijtihad. Ijtihad means to put an effort into arriving at a conclusion, your own conclusion. That's ijtihad. And taqlid is to follow. Every human being has an element of taqlid and an element of ijtihad. Every person. Imam Shafi'i, even though he's one of the greatest scholars of hadith and fiqh, when it came to some issues, he gave a ruling and said, قُلْتُهُ تَقْلِيدًا لِعَطَاءِ ibn أَبِي رَبَحِ I held this opinion, making taqlid of Ata ibn Abi Rabah. Is Ata ibn Abi Rabah a messenger of Allah? No, he's one of the tabi'een. His opinion is not binding on the ummah. But a shafi is convinced with his view, so he took with his, took with his view. No issue. But at the same time, a shafi is capable of ijtihad. Capable of ijtihad. So someone like a Shafi'i, his work is mainly ijtihad. But sometimes taqlid. And that's why Shafi'i said to Imam Ahmad, قَالَ إِذَا صَحَّ عِنْدَكُمُ الْحَدِيثِ فَعَلِمْنَا If a hadith is authentic, tell me about it. So that I can take with it. Because he knew Ahmad ibn Hanbal was great in, in, in his knowledge of hadith. Then a Shafi'i. Even though Shafi'i is older than him. And a Shafi'i is his teacher. But he knows that Ahmad is the muhadith of, of the time. So he says to him, if, if a hadith is authentic, tell me. نَذْهَبُ إِلَيْهِ So that we can take with the hadith. So what's that called? That's taqlid. He's relying on the opinion of Ahmad on, on something. Because if we're human beings, we can't do everything. There's only so much that we can do. So where someone can put a huge amount of effort into researching, researching an issue and coming to their own conclusion, alhamdulillah. If someone can't, then they simply follow a trustworthy individual. They should follow a trustworthy scholar. No problem with that at all. Some people will make taqlid 100%. And if they have no knowledge of the Qur'an, no knowledge of hadith, no knowledge of usul al-fiqh, in order to be able to distinguish between what's correct or incorrect, in terms of fiqhi issues. I'm not talking here about clear-cut issues. <coughs> clear-cut issues doesn't need taqlid. Salah is wajib, doesn't need taqlid. La ilaha illallah doesn't need taqlid. But we're talking about issues where there's some ikhtilaf, some difference. Uh, that's where you can attribute an opinion to a scholar. On things that are ijtihadi, they're not clear cut issues. And no one can say, for example, in the Maliki Madhab, Dhuhr is four rak'ahs. So that's got nothing to do with Madhab. Dhuhr is four rak'ahs, it's for the whole Ummah. That's something that every Muslim has been acting upon from the time of the Prophet until today. There's no such thing as the Maliki Madhab is Dhuhr is four rak'ahs. But you say, for example, the Maliki Madhab is that the saliva of a dog is pure. That's a Madhab. Why is it the Maliki Madhab? Because that's something the scholars disagree over. According to Imam Malik, the saliva of a dog is pure. And according to Abu Hanifa and Shafi'i and Ahmad, the saliva of a dog is najis. So you, here you attribute to a Madhab because they're matters of ijtihad, matters of difference of opinion. Um, the, the role of a, of, a, of a person who is not a scholar is to do what? Is to ask people of knowledge, as Allah says in the Quran. That's, that's his job, that's his role. He's not required to ask any specific person. He simply has to ask someone who fulfills the description of being a person of knowledge. Trustworthy in his religion, trustworthy in his knowledge. That's it. That's all that is required. So his ijtihad is going to be what? His ijtihad is finding a suitable person. That's a form of ijtihad also. You're finding a suitable person. You don't just ask any person. You don't, can't look at someone, he seems religious, he looks like he knows what he's going, you know, talking about. Let me ask him, and then you practice your religion, your worship of Allah according to what this guy says. You don't know who he is. And he said, once Shaykh Muhammad ibn Sahib ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah, someone came up to him, 
and said, Shaykh, I've got a question for you. And he asked him a question. He said, firstly, do you know who I am? He said, no. He said, but you look like Shaykh. He said, how can you ask someone who you don't know who he is? A person could give you something that's completely false, incorrect. So the efforts of a non-scholar is not necessarily going to be to read up on volumes and volumes on issues so he can come to his own conclusions. His effort, his ijtihad is to find a trustworthy person of knowledge. And we do that just as we put an effort into finding the most appropriate doctors. We have our ways of doing that. Okay, qualification, experience, who trusts that person, do other scholars trust this guy, do all the different ways that we do for anything else we use with scholars. Yeah. So can you then at that point go to a different scholar, a different method? Or do you have to stick to the method that you followed? You don't have to stick to a method that you followed. Uh, and that's something that we're going to look at. You don't have to stick to a method that you followed because uh, at the time of the Sahaba, if Abdullah ibn Abbas was asked a question, the person who asked Ibn Abbas doesn't have to follow Ibn Abbas to the Yawm al He can ask Ibn Umar the next day if he wants to. And the next day he can ask Aisha if he wants to. Why did some scholars say it's haram to go against your method? Some scholars said that. They said that if you're following a madhab, you're following the Hanafi madhab. It is haram for you to follow another madhab. Why did they say that? They wanted to prevent people from messing about with the religion. They wanted to stop people from going from scholar to scholar to find opinions that suit them. And find opinions that make life easy for them uh, without justification, without valid justification. And if someone does that, which is called tatabbu al rukhas following concessions, if someone does that, they end up um, not practicing the deen of Allah. They end up following what they want to follow, and then all they do is justify it with the opinion of a scholar. And that's prohibited by ijma' without hesitation. To do this, to go and find the opinions and justification for yourself is not, is not permissible. So some scholars said, people are doing this too much. People are doing this, and people are not following their religion properly, and people are jumping from place to place without any guidelines or principles. Therefore, we say, it's wajib to follow one of the former dhaib. However, according to the Hanbali school, and according to the Shafi'i school, and this is something Imam Nawi rahimahullah has said, who is the shaykh of the Shafi'iyya, and it's something that the majority of the Hanbali scholars say, and that's the madhab of the Hanabila. They say that it's not wajib to follow a madhab. It's not wajib to follow a madhab. So if you've started following the Hanafi madhab, and then you have a question, and in front of you is a Maliki scholar, <coughs> he's there. Do we say you're not allowed to ask him because he's not, he's not Hanafi? No, you can't ask him, and you can take with his fatwa. Because Allah commanded us to ask people of ilm, people of knowledge. So if we've done that, it's fine. Is it permissible to stick to the same method? Yes, it is. Is it permissible to say, I just follow the Hanafi school? Yes, it's permissible to do so. Why is it not permissible? Just as if someone was living next to a scholar, one of the big... Imagine you're living next to Abu Hanifa. Living next to him. And every issue that comes up, you ask Abu Hanifa. Is there a problem? Would someone have an issue with that? Why? There's no issue. Of course there's no issue. So if there's no issue in that, similarly there's no issue in someone saying, look, I know there are many scholars there, and I know there are many opinions there, but I'm not going to go into all these details. I was brought up Hanafi, that's what my family follow. Many scholars in our community are Hanafi, yeah? here in the UK, for example, they've turned it into a Hanafi country, Jazamullah khair. And it's no problem. Uh, say that most scholars here are Hanafi. So I follow the Hanafi Madhab on every single issue. Every problem I have, I follow the Hanafi school. No problem. Permissible. But is it fard? No, it's not fard. Is it permissible? Yes, it is permissible. And what are the benefits of doing so? The benefits of doing so is that number one, you're following a reliable opinion. Because the positions of the Hanafi Madhab are positions of Ahl Sunnah, positions that are reliable positions that many scholars have discussed and, and uh, explained and clarified and proven, etc. So they're reliable opinions. So it's permissible. That's the first benefit. The second benefit is that it gives you structure and order. 
you, you don't fall into confusion. Sometimes you hear this opinion, you jump to that opinion. Another time you hear a different opinion, you jump to that opinion. Another time you hear another opinion, you jump to that opinion. That can cause confusion for a person. So to stick to one method makes life easy. It also helps you to be accurate with your knowledge. Because if you're always listening to 15, 20, 30 different views on issues, knowledge doesn't stick. It goes out the window very quickly. Because you don't know what to follow, what to, what's right, what's right. Whereas if you're following another, you know, look, mashallah, very nice of all these opinions. I just know this opinion. I know this opinion. This is what I know. So you have knowledge of a valid opinion. So it helps with knowledge. And this is why someone who wants to study fiqh should study through a madhab. Because a madhab gives you structure. A madhab gives you organization. A madhab gives you the ability to study uh, something that scholars have put a lot of effort into. Hundreds of books have been written in all the four madhab. Fiqh, usul al-fiqh, explanations of hadith. The scholars of the four madhab have done a lot of effort, put a huge amount of effort into into things. So if you study according to one of the four madhahib, that gives you that that structure to follow. Yeah. So, yeah. What's, the, what's the response to the, the people saying that uh, the madhahibs have divided the ummah, that you know, the Muslims have been uh, distributed to four different madhahibs, and they uh, cite the fact that at the heart of 400 years ago, four sikhah was one for each other. Yeah, so the question is, just for those in here, the, some people say the four madhahib have divided the ummah. And they cause division amongst the Muslims. And in the Haram, for a long period of time, there were four different uh, mihrabs, each madhab. The Hanbalis would pray here, the Hanafis pray there, the Malikis pray there. We say, no problem. That's the actions of people. The actions of people can, uh, can cause division, of course. But division exists outside of the form of the as well. So it's not the, 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 the fact of. It's not the concept of madhahib which caused the problem. That's not the issue. Before the four madhahib scholars, there were divisions like that. Followers of this guy and followers of that guy. Without the four madhahib even being there. Today, you find divisions between people of the same madhahib. The Deobandis, are they, are they Hanafi? Bravies, are they Hanafi? Bravies are Hanafi. Diobandis are Hanafi. The Brailuis and Diobandis are both Ash'i and Maturidi. So their fiqh is the same. Their madhab and aqidah is the same. And both of them are Sufi. The Diobandis and, 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 and the Tayyip. The division between those two and the uh, dispute between those two is, is strong. Is it because of madhab? It's not because of madhab. In some parts of the world, you find uh, one teacher whether in Algeria, whether in Saudi Arabia, whether in Morocco. One of the leading Salafi scholars, one of the leading Salafi scholars. Like this. This guy says, anyone who goes to his class doesn't attend my class. And the other one says, anyone who goes to his class doesn't attend my class. Both of them uh, consider themselves to be Salafi. And both of them are considered to be from the, from the scholars of, uh, and from the Salafi scholars of that country. So it's not about uh, attributing that to a madhab. That's injustice. If you say it about the madhab, say it about this as well. Uh, it's not that. It's that people take things to an extreme. That's what the problem is. Human beings take things to an extreme. And because people take things to an extreme, division occurs because of that. Divisions occur because of that. And as I said to you, division occurred before the former madhab. So it's, it, how does it make sense to attribute it to the former madhab? However... It would be accurate to say that those who are extreme in following it, their madhab, then they have been responsible for some division. Yes. Just as those who are extreme in following a, a madhab in aqidah or a madhab in tasawwuf or a madhab in uh, whatever it is, a group, a sect, a movement, could be a modern day movement. Modern day movements, there are disputes between them. They could be from the same madhab. Has Hizb Tahrir on one side, uh, this group on that side, this group on that side. Divisions are there. Okay, divisions are there. So divisions exist not from the, the presence of the former Dahi, but there's just division exists because of ignorance, an ignorant practice, an incorrect practice. Otherwise, as we said, the former Dahi have existed and ex- been accepted by the scholars of Islam from 1200 years ago till today. If Allah saw that this was falsehood and misguidance, Allah would not have allowed for something to 
flourish in this way amongst the Ummah and for the Ummah to accept it in this manner. So it's important to have to have some balance in this issue. Finally, before before the uh, the adhan, uh, as we said, we've already looked at the issue of the obligation of following a madhab, and we said some scholars argued this for practical reasons. However, most scholars disagree. Most scholars disagree with this idea that you have to stick to one madhab on every issue. They disagree with the idea. They they might think it's recommended. Some of them, some of them will say it's permissible. Some of them say it's practical or it's uh, recommended for a student of knowledge who wants to study fiqh. But to say it is haram to go against a madhab, that needs proof. And if there's no proof that is strong enough to prove that, then we can't, uh, that can't be something that's binding, binding upon the ummah. And I think this is one of the most balanced opinions, which is the position held by many Hanbali scholars. That doesn't say following a madhab is haram, like some minority of people have said. Nor does it say that sticking to one madhab is farv. And at the same time, it doesn't allow for people to, to simply sort of mess about with, with the religion and jump from place to place without any rules. Okay. Um, obviously, because we start, started relatively late and then Aisha is, is 8 o'clock. Um, nonetheless, we've, we've covered some, some things. Does anyone have any comments? Or, or points they want to bring up before we uh, pray? No. Quick question. So when you say you, to someone uh, recently this happened at the workplace, at one of the workplace, one person did not want to pray behind an imam because that imam was leading Zohar and the Muqtadi was doing their Asr. Yeah. And they, the third person said, I don't want to be led by someone who is doing Zohar. Yeah. I want to pray Asr. Yeah. That's fine. That, that's a fair thing to do because uh, this is a position held by I mean, the majority of scholars. They say that you can't pray, you can't pray Dhuhr behind someone praying Asr. You can't pray Asr behind someone. Is that the Hanafi? Is that's the Hanafi madhab. And it's the Hanbali madhab. And it's also the Maliki madhab. And it's an opinion in the Shafi'i madhab. Uh, so it's a majority position. So if someone thinks that I don't believe this is valid, I don't believe this is a valid prayer, they have the right to say, I'm going to pray alone. I'm going to pray alone, I'm not going to pray in this jama'ah because they don't consider it to be valid. But let's say someone decided to do so. They heard that in the Shafi'i Madhab something like this might be permissible. And they decided to do so uh, for, for whatever reason. Uh, we wouldn't say that's haram. We'd say that that's a, a valid thing to do. But if someone said, no, I don't want to, to do that, they have the right, they have the right to do so. Uh, it's a case-by-case issue. It's a case-by-case issue. Uh, uh, sometimes yani, a person will go against their madhab for a valid reason. Other times they will uh, they want to stick to their, to their view that they know because they, they don't find it right. So unity of Muslims, can that take precedence over you following a particular madhab? Yeah, unity takes precedence. Does it? Ha- unity does take precedence. However, someone praying alone doesn't mean that he's disuniting people. He's praying. He's praying alone. And yani, uh, if following something which is not compulsory leads to disunity, then we say no. Don't do that and, and, and keep people united. But not every difference of opinion is disunity. Not every difference of opinion is disunity. And sometimes scholars are traveling together. Every scholar does a different thing. This one combines, that one doesn't combine, this one shortens, that one doesn't shorten, this one shortens at the airport, that one shortens when he gets there, that one. They are different things. It doesn't mean they have to fight because they have different views. Not necessarily. Sometimes different views do, does cause disunity, so that has to be kept in mind. Sometimes different views doesn't cause disunity, so in that case, let people, let people do what they wish. Sisters, do you have any comments? Anything else from the brothers? And uh, next week, next week, Aisha is at 8 o'clock again? Yeah. Okay, so next week, inshallah, we will uh, have the same. Schedule start at seven o'clock up until Isha, inshallah, and we'll try to start at seven o'clock on the dot so that we can get through as much as as we can. Subhanakallah, so, Maybe two, maybe two more lessons. Two more lessons. Maybe two more lessons. Maybe two more lessons, and hopefully, we'll be done. Inshallah.